Hello, and welcome to Change the Face of Yoga, teaching toddlers through golden oldies. I'm very excited to be talking to lots of yoga teachers who will explain their passion for teaching yoga to students with different ages, physical fitness levels, wellness levels, and different goals. They will explain the benefits of yoga for these students and will be including teacher tips and pose modifications. I am Stephanie Cunningham of Yoga Lightness, and I've been teaching over 50s for 10 years. So this area is my passion and the passion of many other yoga teachers that you will be listening to in this series. Thank you so much for listening, and let's get started. Hello, this is episode 45 of Changing the Face of Yoga. I'm interviewing Melanie Klein of the Yoga and Body Image Coalition. She was a co-founder of that coalition, and she has produced two books that tell the stories of people who have been working on their own many times to expand the perception of yoga. So let's listen. Hello, this is Stephanie Cunningham with Changing the Face of Yoga. And I'm very excited to welcome Melanie Klein to the podcast this afternoon. And we're going to be talking a lot about yoga and body image uh, and her new book that's just come out. So welcome, Melanie. And let me give you a little background on Melanie. Uh, She is an empowerment coach, a thought leader, and an influencer, and she sure is, in the areas of body confidence, authentic empowerment, and visibility. She is a successful writer, speaker, and professor of sociology and women's studies at Moore Park College in Ventura County, California, USA. Her areas of interest are media literacy and education, body image, and the intersectional analysis of systems of power and privilege. She is the co-editor of Yoga and Body Image, 25 Personal Stories About Beauty, Bravery, and Loving Your Body, with Anna Guest Jelly. And she is also the curator of a new book that's just come out very recently called Yoga Rising, which is 30 stories from yoga renegades for everybody. She co-founded the Yoga and Body Image Coalition in 2014, and she's been practicing yoga and meditation since 1996. Welcome, Melanie. And is there anything else you'd like to add to that introduction? No, thank you so much for having me. First of all, I'm really honored to be here. And I think, I don't know, I think that encapsulates much of the work that I've been doing over the last 20 plus years. So I appreciate that introduction. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. As you can tell, Melanie is a practitioner of yoga, not yoga, not a teacher, but she is working in another very exciting area of yoga, which is looking at how we can change the culture of yoga to be accepting of everyone. That's a big area, but I think it's a really critical one. And I read something that you wrote that you said when you first started out and wanted to bring yoga into the the cultural thinking about how we do yoga, what's the systems, what's the processes, you felt that critical thinking wasn't really very acceptable in that arena. I agree with you on that in some ways. I was wondering if you think it's gotten better I believe this was written some time ago, if you think it's gotten better and why. Yeah. So before I answer that question, I do want to kind of just look at one thing that you had said leading up to that, which is, yes, it's very true that I, I don't, I'm not a yoga teacher in terms of teaching classes publicly, et cetera. But what had happened is when I was in graduate school, And I was also, you know, already now several years into my practice that I was really open to seeing which direction my work would go. And I had done my yoga teacher training at the White Lotus Foundation in Santa Barbara, California with Ganga White, which is a a Western pioneer in yoga practice and Tracy Rich in the year between my undergrad school degree and my grad school education. And what I found since the beginning, I write about this in Yoga and Body Image, that my feminine 
feminism, my sociological imagination, uh, all of that really married quite well with when I found yoga practice a couple of years later in 1996, that what I found is that they were really all about raising consciousness and doing that in different ways. I talk about in yoga and body image, how feminism freed my mind and yoga freed my body, that they were really wonderful, you know, accompaniments to one another. And so I approached my work in the world. Similarly, I sort of wanted to see what would unfold. And what became clear is that there were actually tons of yoga teachers already starting at about 2002, which was the year that I finished my official yoga teacher training. And that what there was less of was sort of a critical understanding of what was happening in the yoga world at the time. There was less of this conversation happening in academic and activist spaces. And so I felt most called to fill in the gap there, which is why I ended up going in that direction. And what I found very early on was that, um, you know, the yoga culture was changing very rapidly at the time. This was around the time that Yoga Works was bought by a large corporate entity. Mati Ezrati and Chuck Miller had sold it. This is around the time that yoga journal covers began to change, the content began to change. And this was at the very beginning of the yoga celebrity and really sort of looking at yoga culture in the way that we do currently. This was really the first steps. And immediately, you know, my sort of uh, feminist consciousness and my sociological work was very much uh, peaked in terms of its curiosity of what is happening in this landscape. And I noticed that it has became more and more popular. It uh, absorbed the larger cultural trends more and more. And what I mean is in terms of how the fitness industry and the fashion industry and the beauty industry more and more had an impact on yoga and yoga culture, representation of the yoga body, representation of the yoga practice as it became more popular and people understood that it was a currency. It was a cultural currency and they also understood that there was a lot of money to be made. So I immediately started to do research around that and present it in, you know, academic spaces, did a, a piece uh, called Mick Yoga, the Diet for a Spiritual America. I did a piece in 2005 on the nascent beginnings of the yoga celebrity. And so for me, it was really important because I love the practice so much. My practice has been so liberatory and transformational to sort of keep a keen eye on what was happening in terms of is the practice becoming, moving farther and farther away from the potential liberatory benefits as it becomes commercialized and absorbed by the dominant culture. That was really my intention. And there weren't a lot of people talking about it, as you said. There were very few, if I go back to about 2010. And I would certainly say that this conversation has increased exponentially exponentially. I don't think that in 2010 that Anna Guest Jelly and I or many of the other early quote yoga renegades like Roseanne Harvey, Carol Horton, Chelsea Jackson, Diane Bondi, Matt Remsky, I don't think we could have imagined that it actually would have grown this much. It has really become a sort of a monster in and of itself. And it's, it's wonderful that we're having this critical conversation. But even though there's a critical conversation happening now, to the point that if you're not having the conversation, you're sort of out of the loop, that has not changed the fact that yoga continues to be commercialized at a very rapid rate. And so simultaneously, we're having more and more critical conversations, but at the same time, there is a continued increase in the marketing and the commodification of yoga, the yoga body, yoga celebrities. And I would say that for many practitioners who came to yoga in the last five to 10 years, there's really uh, not a world that exists in their mind in which that is not the case. So it's kind of like a case of the sliding doors. We have two parallel realities sort of happening simultaneously, if that makes sense. No, it does. I started in 2001 and I was a student, so I wasn't really paying much attention to all of this. I was just, mm -hmm. but I started to be a teacher in 2007 and I, that, mm -hmm. and I teach, I teach, I'm not teaching this year, but I usually teach seniors. And mm -hmm. of course, so many seniors say to me, oh, well, I can't do yoga because I can't do those poses that you see. And mm -hmm. that's when I understood how narrow yoga had become. 
at least in the mm-hmm. public's eye. I just find this really interesting. And I, I, I read something else you, you said about how to change something that storytelling is very powerful because you can begin to recognize other people who have had an experience that you have not had, but you can empathize with them. And I thought mm-hmm. that's really that's really it, isn't it? That you to change something, you've got to get people to empathize with it and to accept that there are other ways of thinking about it. Yeah, you know, for me, one thing that has happened is definitely we've become, you know, like we said, the critical conversations have increased exponentially, but at the sometimes it feels like there's a disconnect to the humanity of it all. And so what I found to be very effective is when writing uh, about things that can oftentimes get quite heady, can maybe get to be very intellectual, filled with jargon, even in activist spaces around, you know, these issues related to the commercialization and commodification of yoga and the objectification of the a female yoga body, that if we remove it further and further away from the lived experience, I feel it becomes really ambiguous. I feel it becomes something that doesn't hold as much meaning or impact. And so I have found that through yoga and body image and yoga rising, talking about these very things, but from the lived experience of individuals has really allowed these issues to come to life in a new way. It's allowed people who've maybe had different experiences uh, or maybe have had completely different personal ideologies to, to be more interested and warm up to the idea of having these conversations, more willing to have discussions across the divide, I can maybe relate in a new way. And so I find that the personal narrative and you know the bringing in of the real humanity of the people who have these lived experiences is one of the most effective ways to actually bring together, to unify people and to have hard discussions with a lot of heart and a lot of compassion. When you're talking about changing, obviously these stories are at the grassroots level and they're, they're talking to individual people who are either teachers or students or just people with an interest in yoga. Have you, or would you think it's positive, shall we say, to talk to the corporations? Uh, We've had some success with the magazine, the yoga journal and such, but not 100% by any means. But it's really the advertisers and the corporations that own these kind of corporate yoga studios. How do we get the conversation to them? Or do we not? No, I think it's absolutely crucial to have conversations with the sort of, you know, corporate entities that be. And I think it's really important that that, you know, that the grassroots does connect with these uh, individuals and companies and being very mindful of the individuals who work for these corporations have their own constraints. You know, there's market constraints. They have constraints to this larger, you know, entity called the corporation itself. And that so while the people working there may have good intentions, or may have certain desires, they may be constrained by the actual structure of the corporation. With that said, it's still important to bring the conversations there and for the corporations to understand that it is absolutely possible to create a profit while not necessarily continuing to replicate all of the sort of toxic messages and images and the status quo that exists in the market in general. There, I feel that yoga as a practice and as a culture that says it is committed to consciousness raising and personal and you know external transformation really lives the philosophy in our day-to-day life that we take it you know proverbially off the mat and the cushion which is that we have the ability to construct our culture and the industry of yoga in a way that can be full of integrity can be full of you know positive intention but can still reap a a profit. We don't have to replicate the existing models. And I think that it sort of represents a lack of imagination and creativity when we do what has already been done by these other industries. And 
you know, Rolf Gates mentions that in his contribution to yoga and body image, that we really can create this culture and imagine it the way that we want. And I, I think that that is really something that I'm looking towards is how can we as a grassroots movement, as individuals, as corporations, how can we create something anew that is much more sustainable, on a professional, personal, psychic, and financial level that really, really reflects the practice of yoga in the way that it is moving out into the world. And I think that's an ongoing conversation to have. What do you think we can do as a first step for that? I think it's to have these really critical conversations and to be open and, you know, for corporations to be willing to listen to the grassroots and to give credit to the grassroots, to be quite honest, that this is not about commodifying or co-opting the message, which unfortunately I've seen done. You know, a lot of times there have been people with a lot of followers on Instagram or other social media accounts or corporations who recognize, oh, there's a new buzzword. It's body positivity. Or, oh, there's a new buzzword. It's accessibility and diversity. And that not to just latch on to these hashtags and buzzwords as a new way to sell without doing the work or to co-opt it from the individual and the grassroots movements and organizations who have really been making these inroads, but to listen to those communities, listen to those individuals, give real sort of props and kudos and a greater amount of visibility to those individuals and organizations and elevate it in that particular way. I think it's really listening and uh, and kind of moving beyond a lot of the resistance that is had by both corporate entities and those who work for them, resistance that a lot of yoga celebrities have feeling that they're being personally attacked, as well as resistance that a lot of the members of the grassroots have about working with them, that we can really come together in our humanity and our shared passion for the practice and our desire to share that and to have those honest conversations. And that can happen both publicly and privately. I feel that that is the first step. How does your starting the Yoga and Body Image Coalition fit into that? Well, the Yoga and Body Image Coalition was created now over four years ago as an opportunity to really aggregate all of the individuals who had been working on these issues on their own in different ways in their communities with the understanding that if we became an aggregated mass, uh, that we would have much greater reach And we would also be taken much more seriously, which has happened. And to also have an opportunity to collaborate, to commune, to uplift one another, and also to really make ourselves more known and at the same time serve as checkpoints for the conversation in terms of the work that's being done. And I feel that that's, I feel that's been done really well. And people have been excited from the moment the coalition announced itself. People were really keen to come together and to be part of something larger. And all of the work that we've done has really rested on the themes and the issues that Anna, guest Jelly, and I uh, helped bring to light with the stories that we presented in Yoga and Body Image. So it just made sense. Hey, look, there's all these people in different parts of the world doing this work in their own way, oftentimes in isolation. Let's all come together and really create this wonderful community where we can kind of break through the clutter of what we tend to see in social media and the representations of yoga and show them like the the hashtag that we created, quote, what a yogi looks like, what yoga looks like, and kind of break through these very repetitive and one-dimensional images and messages to create something anew. And that was really the intention. And I think it's been very successful over the years. I do too. I, I think it's been very good. A very non-scientific <laughs> idea here. <laughs> but I, it just seems to me that sure. maybe, and maybe it's because I've blocked people, but I, I don't think I've ever actually ever blocked anybody on Facebook. Uh, but I, I see a lot less of those young, blonde, bendy pictures doing incredible things on the top of mountains. <laughs> and I, mm-hmm. I just see a lot less of those now. And I'm wondering if... Oh, no, there's plenty of them. There, they're still there. <laughs> I plenty. must not be in the right places, okay? <laughs> it just seems like there's a lot less. There's lots of okay, that. Still. 
There is a lot of it. And I feel like there's continues to actually be more and more, which is why I say that it's sort of this sliding. Yeah, like this a sliding door reality that more and more we have alternatives to that. While at the same time, that trend continues to grow and increase because you have to understand that still is the predominant image and representation of yoga. And listen, it's really enticing for a lot of young people. Really, really, really enticing for a lot of people. You know, young people equate it. There's this really romantic image that goes with it. There is this idea of popularity and acceptance and validation that's happening there, right? I have, you know, all these people who are watching me and telling me how great I am and oh, and I can make money and look at this is beautiful and sexy. It's really enticing. So there are still a lot of people who come to the practice and who experience the practice who desire this and and work towards that and more and more capable of doing that by following that specific formula. While at the same time, there are more and more people who have both been on both sides of the fence who are creating something anew. So it's not that that's diminished, but the other side of it has grown. The alternatives have grown. Um, Like I said, even people who once sort of held that position who have shifted their work, their intention, and their message, while at the same time, there are more and more people jumping on that bandwagon. And it's not even so much that I have a problem with with those images or those people. I feel like there's room for everyone. My biggest thing has not even necessarily been to eliminate that. It's been more about creating more space and room for all of the other bodies, voices, experiences, and people doing work that have not currently been reflected on magazine covers, who are not being featured, you know, um, in large venues. For me, it's been a really big desire to shine a light on that and, and kind of just making peace with, you know, listen, some of those accounts can be inspiring. Sometimes those images are compelling and I enjoy looking at them, but those are not the only images and that I want to look at. Those are not the only stories that I want to hear. Those are not the only faces that I want to have coming through my feed. These are not the only people that I think should receive accolades for their work. I want to really expand, you know, the circle to make room for everyone. I agree with that. I think in my one unscientific (laughs) example, I probably now am picking up those other people more than I'm picking up the more traditional pictures of yoga. And so my consciousness, shall we say, has has flipped, even though I never have been in that space. I've always, I, I started yoga late and I've always taught mostly older people. So I've always been over on the other side. But I just wonder, I mean, one of the reasons I do changing the face of yoga is to try to get out to the public, the uh, people that are just kind of interested in yoga, or maybe our students of yoga, to say there is there is a whole bunch of teachers and therapists out there teaching almost everybody. And here's their stories. But I, I feel that most people accept yoga as a young person's activity and a, a young, able, flexible person's <laughs> activity. And I, I just yeah, wonder absolutely. how we can, I, I, I certainly agree. And I think you've done, the coalition has done a wonderful job and I, I really appreciate it. In fact, I right now have my, this is what a yogi looks like shirt on. It was not planned. I just, gra- I, Ooh, I just grabbed it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you're going to have to take a picture of you in it and email that to me so I can share it. <laughs> and um, I just, but I just wonder, and I understand, uh, you know, changing a culture is a little difficult, but it did change kind of rapidly at the beginning because I think of all the money behind it and all the advertising. And I, I don't want to get rid of the young people that are having a great time doing yoga and doing these very fancy poses either, but I would really like people out there to know that, yes, this is one form of yoga, but there's lots and lots of of yoga. And I'll bet there's one for you. Yeah. And that's what we've been doing. I mean, from, you know, Jeevana Heyman at Accessible Yoga to the work we've done with Yoga International, to the coalition, to all of the other individuals, you know, the yoga for all training, all of these different things I think have done that. And so we've created new 
uh, images and messages and stories. I mean, I'm always talking as a media literacy professor that representation matters. And so for me, one of the first things that the coalition and I did was to create new images, to have new feature stories, um, to highlight and elevate, use this platform, right? This aggregated platform that was getting attention to highlight the teachers and the practices and the bodies, right? And the experiences of all of those other people that were being left out of that representation. And to show that, you know, you don't have to be able-bodied or flexible or of a certain weight or a certain height or of a certain race or gender or any of those things. So I think that that's happening. And I think it's going to just continue to increase. And I feel like, you know, listen, the young people are going to age. (laughs) Uh, Not only are they going to age in their bodies, but they're going to age Mm -hmm. in their practice. I mean, something that Catherine Budig uh, had said, you know, who for many years was the poster child of the able-bodied, flexi, bendy, young, thin, blonde yogi in a bikini, she has so radically shifted her work. And a lot of that has been that as she has aged and her body has changed and she's been around longer, it really gave her new insight, wisdom, and experience. And she shared that. And I really do feel that, you know, as these younger individuals who are really making a big splash on Instagram, as they not only age in their bodies, but as they age in their experience are going to have new layers uh, of wisdom revealed. I mean, I really do feel that and, and that will be reflected as they go on. And so feel that we just need to make room for everyone, specifically making room for those who are marginalized currently and are not represented, that I feel very, very satisfied with challenging those representations by doing the work that has been done and continuing with that and letting it grow in exponential and unexpected ways. Now, you had a book that you co-authored with Anna Guest Jelly, and now you have a new book, Yoga Rising, and Mm -hmm. you say that you curated it. I love that term. Why did you feel that another book was needed? Oh, for many reasons. One, the conversation was not complete at the end of book one. Anna and I really intended for book one to focus on the transformational benefits of a consistent yoga practice on our relationship to our body and the improvement of our body image. That was really the primary goal. Now, inevitably, um, there were critiques of yoga culture and the business of yoga that came through in the first book, but that really wasn't the primary intention. The primary intention was focusing on all the benefits, all of the wonderful things that we gain from that. Book two, we knew we wanted to dive in more into the critiques. And for me, not only did I want to dive more into some of the critiques, that very sort of, you know, a lot of the more... I would say, complex components of the conversation. I also wanted to continue by saying, okay, great. So what happens once we make body peace or what happens once we come to a place of body acceptance? And for me, that was, what are you able to do? Who are you able to become? How do you get to show up in your community and in the world and for yourself when you have body peace? So book one was like, hey, I came to peace. I came to acceptance here's how I used to struggle and now yoga helped me and now I'm in a better place. Book two is like, okay, now what do we do? What are the possibilities for us when we come into a place of peace and acceptance? How can we then actively ignite and you know empower ourselves and, and step into the world in a new way? So for me, it was an extension of a conversation. It was a very necessary extension of the conversation. There are just so many stories. I didn't feel that the first 25 really was enough. I felt that there were other pieces of the puzzle. There were other experiences that we didn't get to share in the first book. And I feel that they're there in the second book. So yeah, I just, it, it, I was compelled. I knew okay. we weren't done. <laughs> and so, yeah, so I just, I just continued um, to make sure that there was more space for these to come to light. And is there a book three? <laughs> there is. Yeah. Book three was revealed as I was working on book two. I, I, I've put a little pause on it right now. Some of those stories are written, others are happening, but what the only reason book three was revealed, to be honest, is because there was a theme that emerged, which was about trauma and grief 
and, you know, really how yoga practice allows us to move through the more difficult and challenging moments in our life with greater ease. Book three is not really related to body image anymore, per se. Book three then kind of uh, looks to explore how our practice can support us in all of the adversities of our life in a way that we can show up, like I said, with more grace and ease. So there are stories of you know, dealing with the death of a loved one. There are stories about sexual assault and molestation. There are stories of other traumas and and obstacles and and how yoga showed up for those individuals. And so some of these stories were supposed to be in book two. And I realized, okay, yeah, there's something new and these need a different place. And so that, yeah, it was just a very organic thing. Okay. Well, good. We can look forward to another book then. (laughs) So (laughs) if If you had a piece of advice for yoga today, Uh (laughs) and we'll make it the big yoga today, Mm -hmm. what would you say? Again, that is a broad question, but if I had to look at it generally, I would say for yoga, yoga practitioners is to really step deeply inside their own practice and ask themselves how their life reflects the very personal and intimate practice that they experience. How much do those two things align? How much of the practice is being taken off the mat? How much of their practice is really informing the way that they move in the world? And I think that if we can begin to answer the question in a way that it's like, yes, my yoga practice infiltrates my lived experience beyond the mat, beyond the cushion. I think then that is enough for me because that means that our consciousness is being raised and we are being more conscious about the things that we do, the things that we share, how we move in the world. It's not something that is only when a picture is being taken or is only when you know that 30 or 90 minutes is being taken. And if we can answer that, honestly and authentically. I think that that is the beginning of really creating, you know, deep and meaningful shifts. If you want to get a hold of Melanie. We are all over social media. So if you go to Instagram, you can go to YBI Coalition uh, or Mel Mel Klein. Also, if you are interested in going to the book websites, we have specific book websites. We have yogaandbodyimage.org and we also have yogarisingbook.com. What's great about both of these uh, websites for the books is not only do they detail all of the contributors and give information. We also have free downloadable discussion guides. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested, yeah, and having these conversations in your communities, you can download these discussion guides and it is very clear on how to facilitate groups, questions to ask. So really encourage people to do that. And if that's something that people are interested in doing, the coalition is also happy to support that. You can go to ybicoalition.com and you can reach out to us via email. We can help people put together events and then promote them in their area. We are also always keen to have people who are interested in having a more formal partnership to go to YBICoalition.com and look under the team page about how to join and become an active community partner. That's another wonderful way to become more involved. And also, if uh, people want to take a look, my own website, uh, Melanie C. Klein, is coming soon. And that is sort of an amalgamation of all the work that I've done. Uh, But people also can reach out to me on social media. Instagram is a great forum. So I'm visible all over the place. The coalition is visible all over the place and would love to have anyone and everyone who's interested in participating to reach out. Uh, If people also are looking, what are some other ways that I can be active and involved and support beyond becoming a partner? And one of the things that you had said is you have your, you know, you have your shirt at ybicoalition.com slash support. We have actually all of our different designs, which is really our only source of funding. We are completely grassroots. And so when people buy our t-shirts from everybody is a yoga body, 
I am body positive. This is what a yogi looks like. Representation matters. All of those, that is actually what funds and continues to fuel our website and all of our endeavors. And it's also a wonderful way that when people buy the shirt and they take photos of themselves and post them and use our hashtag, what a yogi looks like and tag us, we are able to regram and share that. And that's one of the ways that we can, you know, put more diversity of content out there and highlight, you know, really all the everyday yogis all around the world and share their image and share their story. So that's another wonderful thing. And finally, we accept submissions all the time to use our platform and where we have blog posts. If people want to share their story or share their work and want to write, they're definitely welcome to write. So there's so many different ways to get involved. And we really cherish this community. And uh, we're looking to hear it from you. And I want to thank you for providing the platform to even share news about the new book and to share ways that people oh, can get welcome. involved. I'm, so I'm really glad I could do it. I will put all those contact details in the show notes for you guys. I want to thank you, Melanie. It was really fascinating. And I think you're doing, you and the coalition are doing a great job. And I agree that telling people's story is a very powerful way to bring notice to some things and to give people an idea for different things. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful interview. If you would like to be a guest on Changing the Face of Yoga, please go to my website, www.yogalightness.com.au and under the Changing the Face of Yoga tab, you can complete Be Our Guest form. After reviewing the form and finding it applicable to this podcast, we will send you a link to schedule an interview. Please download, review, and tell your friends of any podcasts that are of interest to you and to them. If you would like to contact me, send an email to info at yogalightness.com.au And thank you for listening to Changing the Face of Yoga.